It is time for yet another episode of my Overwatch League team preview series. In this episode, we shall be exploring what the Guangzhou Charge have been up to in order to get a better idea of what we think of them heading into Season 4. If I'm going to be completely honest, they definitely did slip under my radar this offseason. It was not very exciting for them. It could have gone worse, but also a lot better, I suppose. Time to find out why that is. As usual, the player and coaching departures will kick us off. The first two guys on the chopping block would be Neptuno and Chara. Guangzhou completely cleared out their main support rotation. Very interesting strategy. Neptuno not getting a contract renewal, I think that makes a lot of sense because first off, he was not all that impressive when he actually got to play. Second of all, he was barely around anyway thanks to ongoing visa issues. And finally, the charge literally started to play better when Chara became the starter. So yeah, Neptuno being gone, that's fine. But Chara, that's a bit tougher. Not only did he serve as the team captain and leader, but he genuinely was coming off a decent year. Don't get me wrong, he definitely was not a top 5 main support. In the grand scheme of things, he was definitely replaceable. In fact, he's probably one of the first people you'd want to replace if you're looking to take your team to the next level. But with how the charge did this offseason, that is clearly not the case right now. Chara was a relatively consistent and stable member of the charge. So to see them part ways with him has me wondering. How much could this end up hurting the team moving forward? Moving on from the main supports, the Charge decided to part ways with their two-way players, WYA and Crystal. No surprises here, not at all. Much like Neptuno, WYA was pretty much never with the team because of the pandemic and visa issues. Not like it mattered that much anyway considering he was a two-way player who was going to be competing for playtime with Chu. On the other hand, Crystal maybe I think that's a bit more questionable I suppose. When the Charge suddenly signed him out of nowhere during the summer, it felt like the stars were aligning for him to take Nero's place. Plus, believe it or not, but Crystal is still a very talented individual. The potential has always been there, and we witnessed it firsthand both in 2019 and everything before then. I guess the charge ultimately decided that it wasn't worth having him on the roster alongside Eileen. Not too big of a deal, I guess. Speaking of big deals, though, that transitions us into the final three players on the charge departure list. Shu, Nero, and Happy would all go their separate ways as we'd see them join the Gladiators, Shock, and Outlaws, respectively. Now, these are the types of losses that kind of hit home. This especially goes for Shu because he's been a solid flex support for two years running. He was a major reason why they found as much success as they did during their peaks, both in Stage 4 2019 and the Summer Showdown just one year later. Now transitioning to Nero, he was probably the loss that hurt the least out of these three. Nero was good during the early parts of Season 3, and of course late in Season 2, but the fact of the matter is that Eileen is simply a better option. I don't think I need to tell any of you the level of improvement the charge saw when Eileen took the starting mantle away from him when Nero had to go renew his visa. They went from a good and inconsistent team to summer showdown champions who could topple even the likes of the Shanghai Dragons. Eileen was literally an MVP candidate for crying out loud. Maybe besides like Farah, he played everything Nero did but better. What on earth would be the point of Nero getting a new contract when you have that? And who's to say more visa issues don't end up coming about in the future? Plus, it's better for Nero this way. I know he loved his teammates on Guangzhou a ton, but playing in America is going to make him feel a lot more at home and I'm expecting him to just be happier in general. The fact that the shock of all teams took an interest in him made the deal even sweeter, because if you did not know, Nero was actually from California, so this was the best possible scenario. And finally, there's Happy. I lay somewhere in the middle ground with him. Losing him is definitely a bigger deal than losing Nero, but at the same time, probably not as bad as Shu leaving. Happy is an elite hitscan player, no doubt about it. He's a sniper extraordinaire who can keep pace with just about anybody in the league. He's a very serviceable option, and he's definitely somebody who can completely take over a series on any given day. But the thing is, Happy can be a little streaky at times. Not to mention that DPS is arguably the most replaceable position in all of Overwatch because there are so many good pro DPS players out there. They're literally everywhere. It's why teams usually have three or more on their roster at a time. So yeah, Happy's mechanics and counter sniping are great, but there are abundant numbers of rookies out there who could have ceilings that are just as impressive, if not even higher. Replicating his level of sniping is no easy task, so there's definitely reason to feel sad here, but it's not worth believing it'll be the end of the world. Those are going to be all of the players though. It's crazy to see four of their OG core members that were there since the beginning now gone. Speaking of OG members, that transitions us over to the coaching. The charge decided it was time to wipe their entire staff and start off fresh. I think the opinions on all of them leaving are going to be mixed. Those upset by the departures are going to bring up how successful they have been in the regular season the last two years, which is definitely a fair point. 
Sure, they've never come close to even sniffing a title, but they always have put themselves in a position to at least give them a chance to. They qualified for the play-ins in Season 2, and finished second place in Asia during Season 3. And let's not forget the insane dominance they showed during the Summer Showdown either. This team has posted decent results. However, as mentioned before, they've come nowhere close to winning a championship. They've won one playoff game in two years. That one match came in the play-ins against the Chengdu Hunters, and that's it. They've been widely unsuccessful when it matters most. Sure, this team has been able to spread joy consistently throughout the regular season, but it's no fun to see your team not even put up a fight when it truly matters. After two years of the same thing, I think it's about time for a change, and I'm sure Charge fans are very thankful for what they did, and they know it's time to say goodbye to these OG coaches in Jin, Taidola, and Sungwoo, along with Creed who joined the team in 2020. Okay, so that is everything the Charge have lost. It was a pretty tough offseason, I would say. Lots of tough decisions that had to be made, and lots of goodbyes. But what did they do to compensate? Well, to start, they signed Kareev to try and fill the hole left behind by Shu. So this signing is interesting. Kareev is definitely not a bad player. He's still a solid, above-average option. But clearly, he is a downgrade compared to Shu on paper. Shu was playing at a different level in 2020, while Kareev saw a little bit of regression, actually. I have no doubt in my mind that Kareev can make good contributions, but can he deliver with the same impact and consistency of Shu? I'm leaning towards no. But of course, you never really know at the end of the day, because after all, Kareev has never played on an Overwatch League roster where they primarily speak Korean. He's always been on English-speaking rosters where he can't communicate and make calls at maximum effectiveness. He might show some improvements simply because he can do better at staying on the same page with his teammates. Kareev is definitely somebody to look out for this year. There's a fair amount of pressure on him to perform, or the charge could end up taking a serious step backwards from where they were a half year ago. Joining Kareev on the new Guangzhou support line is Mon. Do. First off, let me say how happy I am that he is getting a fair chance to prove himself. I was very nervous that he'd be gone after playing like one map for the NYXL in 2020, but no, the charge want to give him the proper chance that he deserves. Because to be honest, he really did feel like a promising prospect coming out of contenders back in the day. People were kind of excited to see him. He's the only main support on this roster currently, so the charge must really see something in him. I fully do intend to give Mondu a fair chance, but I have to say that this does kind of feel like a risk. I would have at least gotten one other option so you can try them if Mondu does not pan out in the way you think he could. Whether he's good, bad, or somewhere in between, the charge are now stuck with him. This is the choice they made, and now they have to live with whatever consequences that may come with it. I can't say for certain if he's going to be an upgrade or downgrade compared to Chara. He's played one map of Overwatch in like one year. Generally speaking, I'm not absurdly confident or anything like that. He'll be good on Lucio for sure, that's a specialty, and he might even be a decent Mercy, at least better than Chara, but I'm not too sure about his Brigitte, and I have major question marks about his Baptiste. Mondu has a lot to prove all while dealing with tons of pressure along the way. The battle ahead is going to be tough, but if he does end up keeping his composure, the risk of signing him just might end up paying off. Next, the charge made their decisions on who would replace Happy and Nero. Say hello to Mai K. Lee and Choi Swan. Honestly, not too bad. These are two promising rookies who could definitely make up for those departures. Nothing is guaranteed, of course, but they both appear to be pretty capable prospects. Mai K. Lee, he's a Chinese player hailing from Billy Billy Gaming, and let me tell you, he's got a lot going for himself. The big part of his game to highlight is how deadly of a sniper he is. His Widowmaker and Ash are no joke. I heard he played extremely well in his tryouts as well. If he clearly has what it takes to be a consistently dominant hitscan player, then the rest of the league needs to look out. Replicating Happy is a lot to ask for, but I think he just might be able to pull this off. And what's cool about Mai K. Lee as well is that he can actually flex off the general hitscan role a tiny bit. He's played Echo and some Projectile before, so he could make for a decent overall flex option when this team needs to make quick in-game adjustments. Because I can't tell what his ceiling is just yet, I don't really consider him to be an upgrade or downgrade compared to Happy. He could be a little more valuable due to his flexibility, but I'm not willing to confirm anything just yet until I see him play a bit. Alright, but what about Choice One? Well, I'm slightly less excited about him. Not that he's not a good pickup or anything, because he definitely is, it's more that we might not see him consistently because of Eileen. This man definitely is skilled though, he honestly has been around for a lot longer than you might think too. Despite only turning 18 in October, he played for Kongdu Panthera, then Element Mystic as the replacement for Sparkle of all people. He's got some serious experience under his belt and a pretty good hero pull to back it up. He's a solid projectile player with a very stereotypical flex DPS hero pull ranging from Genji and Echo to Doomfist and Junkrat. He's also got that explosiveness that you're looking for in a young player, that's for sure. 
Again though, the issue is that Eileen is still here. He was one of the biggest contributors on the charge in Season 3. He made that team what they were. Also, I would argue Eileen has a larger hero pool, and he's a bit better at picking up new characters quickly. But does that mean we'll never see this new rookie on the stage ever? Of course not. There might be some things he's better than Eileen at for all I know. Plus, you never know how much better he could be for team synergy purposes since he is Korean and all. He's not somebody to be absurdly excited about given the circumstances, but make sure to keep him in mind. Moving on from the DPS though, the charge decided to make one more move before calling it quits with their player roster. In a surprising turn of events, they signed former London Spitfire main tank Jihoon. It's funny too because Jihoon temporarily retired after leaving London. I guess the itch to compete must have come back or something. But the thing is, I'm really not sure how much he offers the charge. Clearly Ryo is going to be their guy, they like him a lot, that's why they brought him back for a third year. And to be completely honest, Wrecking Ball is probably the only character I could think of that Jihoon will definitely or at least maybe be better on. I can't even say anything's guaranteed here. You absolutely want Ryo on Orisa over him, and I would venture to say he's the superior Reinhardt and Winston as well. But then again, maybe I'm not thinking outside the box enough here. Maybe his use will go beyond the typical main tank heroes in the game. After all, the charge very much did struggle on Sigma Hog during the playoffs. Maybe Jihoon can be the solution. And I suppose I guess it's just nice in general to have another option on hand in case Ryo does suddenly not get the job done anymore. Having an extra tank player on hand isn't really a terrible idea, I'm just not entirely sure what his role will end up being. Okay, so now on to the coaches. Honestly, my initial reaction from the offseason remains unchanged. I like the idea of having Arachne as the head coach, plus two former players in Neko and Damon as the assistants. It gives this team a nice balance, I feel. Arachne is a disciple of Krusty, who just might be able to use that knowledge he gained from the shock to his advantage. Neko, he's a veteran of the game, who might be well suited to teach the rookies on this team how to improve quickly. I could even see him being a great individual support coach or something. And Damon, he might be the most pleasant surprise of all. Meme on him all you want to about the 140 Shanghai Dragons days when he played, but as a coach he's already kind of proven himself. He helped guide that Almut Mystic team in the post-Rush era, and he did a pretty decent job if you ask me. If everything can stick together the right way, this coaching staff could end up being an upgrade compared to what they were working with previously. And that is going to wrap up the Guangzhou offseason. It was pretty meh. It was far from the worst in the league, but also nowhere near the top. My offseason grade for the charge is a C. Very pedestrian. Some good happened, but I feel like mostly bad. It's cool that they changed the coaching up a bit and made some adjustments at DPS, but none of it makes them feel any better than last year. If anything, they might have gotten a bit worse because they're essentially the same team but with an arguably worse support line. If other teams in Asia did not improve so much, maybe it wouldn't be the end of the world. But to me it feels like the charge are now on a downward trend and they're starting to fall behind some of their competition. It's highly unlikely that they're going to finish second place in Asia again. They feel to me like they're heading more towards the bottom half of that region. They could still be a relatively competitive team, but the offseason hurt their overall ceiling. There's things about this roster to love and hate. What I love is that two of their biggest pieces are still around. They still do have Eileen for superstar DPS contributions, and Krong, who is coming off a top 5 offseason among all off tanks. Those two alone skyrocket your chances in any game, regardless of the opponent. I'm also feeling pretty good about their new DPS. My K. Lee in particular could be very good. I mean, the team seriously might not even miss Happy all that much if he proves to be just as consistent, if not better. The issue though is what lies beyond all that. I love Kareev to death, but it's very difficult to envision him having a higher impact than Shu did. It's very hard to see it. Mondo on the other hand, I think he's great, it's really cool to see him back in the league, but he is vastly unproven. How can I expect him to be a guaranteed replacement for the leadership that Chara brought to the table? And what about Ryo? He seems like a stagnant piece who will continue to remain unchanged. What's good about this is you know what you're going to get. A decent player who is slightly above average at the main tank role. But that's also a bad thing at the same time. Ryo is not who you need if you're looking to get past being playoff pretenders. I like his Orisa a lot, it's one of the best in the league, but his other characters don't quite compare, and general flexibility did prove to be a major issue after what we saw in the playoffs last year. This team just feels mediocre. I have my doubts about them finishing in the top half of the league, so my guess is that they finish anywhere from 16th 
through 11th place in the overall standings. If everything clicks, if all of their gambles pay off, and if some of their players show improvement, maybe they can pull off top half of the league, or at least close to it. That's asking for a lot, and playing in Asia is not doing them any favors here. Could they realistically beat most teams in this region? Sure they could, but I could also see them getting exploited by pretty much anybody on any given week as well. Unless I have horribly misjudged them here, this could be a tough year filled with lots and ups and downs if you're a fan of the charge. And with that said, ladies and gentlemen, that is going to wrap up this episode of the Overwatch League team preview and offseason recap series. If you enjoyed it, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe so you don't miss out on the next episode. While you're at it, let me know how you feel about the charge down in the comments below. And until next time, this is ATP, signing out. Peace.